One thing that we'd really like to know is how the velocities of the joints, so how fast I move each of these joints here, which you can see by how long these arrows are, how that affects with the velocity of the end effector. So the end effector is shown by this green arrow here. So as I move these inputs, how do I figure out how that translates to my end effector velocity and its angular velocity? And so one thing to remember is that these inputs that we do actually depend on the configuration of the robot. So right here, if I have a negative theta 1 and a positive theta 2, and I get rotations off to the right, if instead I move this way over here, put those to the same inputs here, now I get a rotation off to the left. So this mapping that we get from joint velocity to end effector velocity really depends on the current configuration of the robot. One other thing that I'm going to point out for free is that this ellipse that we have over here, we're mapping all possible rotations on the edge of this unit ball in the joint velocity space into the workspace. And so you can see here that interesting things happen on the boundary here, where those achievable velocities, the end effector, shrink down to be just on this line here. Every combination of these two inputs gives us a vector that's just along this line here. So our instantaneous velocity is reduced to a one degree of freedom space. So the tool that we use to go between the velocity of our joints into the velocity of the end effector is the Jacobian. So this is related to the work of a famous dead mathematician. What it is, is we build a matrix of all the first order partial derivatives of a vector valued function. And so our vector valued function that we have is our forward kinematics. And so we take that forward kinematics and the top left one we take degree of freedom one and we take the partial derivative with respect to how q1 moves. And this entire first row is degree of freedom one with respect to all the different joints. So this is joint n. Whereas as we go down in the first column each new row is going to be for a different degree of freedom. So this is degree of freedom m here partial with Q1. All the way over here, this is our partial degree of freedom with degree of freedom M with respect to Qn. And so this J matrix that we build, it's going to tell us what is our linear and our angular velocity of our end effector. We get that by multiplying it by our Jacobian of our current configuration, and then we multiply that by how fast we're moving each of our joints. So this is speed of joints. The thing to remember, of course, is that this j that we have is a function of q, and so you have to recompute that j at every different configuration. So now let's talk about the general case of rotation. Let's say that somebody gives you um, some arbitrary object, this rock that we have right here, and we have it rotate around some axis at the origin O. And we want to know how fast are points moving on it. Well, if something is a rigid body, if it rotates at a certain omega speed, angular speed, then every point on that body, every point on this body is also going to move with the same angular velocity. They will have different linear velocities, but they'll all have the same angular velocity. What we do is we establish an axis of rotation, and we have a unit vector on there. I'm going to call this unit vector k. So that is a unit vector in direction of axis of rotation. Theta dot is how fast is theta changing. So it's just a time derivative of theta. Usually I care about a certain point, and here I'm caring about this point P, and I would like to know how fast is it moving. In order to do that I have to know how far it is away from that origin. That distance is called R. My omega is a vector quantity. And we get that by taking theta dot and we multiply it by my k hat. 
my instantaneous velocity v is equal to omega cross my r. So r is my vector for my origin. Omega is coming out of the page. So we can write this as equal to theta dot k cross r. Now let's look at this skew symmetry. Well, to be skew symmetric, s i j plus s j i has to equal to zero. And that's true for these are three by three matrices. So we've got i and j is in the set one, two to three. And what this also tells us is that whenever we've got s i i, that has to equal zero. So what we can do is we can compute these skew symmetrics from the instantaneous derivatives around base vectors. And so I've got SI, that's going to be no rotation around the x-axis, and everything is going to be 0, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0. Or SJ, that's going to be zeros in the y column, and 0, 0, negative 1, 1, 0, 0 around my k unit vector, get 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so if I sum these all together for some arbitrary vector a, where a is equal to some ax, ay, az, well, I can just propagate those in. I've got a 0, az, negative a y, and I've got a negative a z, zero a x, and then an a y, negative a x, zero. My skew symmetric around an arbitrary vector a. So now I'd like you to go through these next values here, one through four, and see if you can write them in. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can name these properties and give what the answers are for each of these. So first property, we've got the skew symmetric of alpha a plus beta b. Well, that's going to be equivalent to alpha, which is a scalar value, times a skew symmetric of a plus beta times the skew symmetric of b. This is the property of linearity. The skew symmetric property has linearity. Next, I've got vector a and p. They're both in R3. I want to get s of a times p. The property that we have for that is that this is a cross product with p. So that tells us a skew symmetry defines a cross product. And so a reminder of what the cross product does. Remember, it's maximized when we're 90 degrees out of phase. It is zero when we are 180 degrees out of phase. So we have these two vectors and the cross product. It is minimized when it's negative 90 degrees out of phase. And then when we rotate back to zero, it is zero again. Next property that we have, if A is a vector in R3, and then R is a special orthogonal matrix of order 3, then R times S of A times R transpose is going to be the same as taking S of RA. So this is the similarity transform. My next property, if A and P are in Rn, these are vectors, I take a vector and multiply it by the skew symmetry times the vector transpose, I get zero. So this is a vector transform property. So these are four properties that we will use for dealing with angular velocity. So next problem, we want to take the derivative of a rotation matrix. So for this one, we're going to assume that our rotation matrix R is a function of just one variable, theta. So we'll write this as R of theta. We'll be able to expand that later. The technique that we're going to use to come up with the derivative of the rotation matrix is we're going to assume the answer. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume our derivative is going to have this skew symmetric property. So if we take any rotation matrix and multiply it by its transpose, 
Well, the transpose is equal to the inverse. And so what we're going to get is the identity matrix. I can take the derivative of each side. On one side, if I take the, der the time derivative of the identity matrix, I'm just going to get 0. So now to take the derivative of the left side, well, I'm going to have to apply the chain rule. So I'll do it for the first term. I'll take the derivative of the first term times the second term, and then I'll take the first term times the derivative of the second term. And so I get d d theta is the only term that can change in here times my r theta times my r theta transpose. And then I've got my first term r of theta times my d d theta of r theta this quantity transposed. So here's where we're going to assume the answer. We're going to say that s is my answer, and we'll say set that equal to one of these terms. So d d theta r of theta times r of theta transpose. And then if I take this and I take the transpose of this term, well, I take this entire term here, take its transpose, that is equal to just r of theta times d d theta of r theta, this quantity transposed. Well, we can now solve for what this d d r is, and it is just that d d theta of r is equal to s times r of theta. And so we have our solution. The time derivative of some rotation matrix is just going to be a skew symmetric matrix times the current rotation matrix. Now in the general case uh, for an angular velocity where we're rotating around some omega axis that can be time varying, is this time derivative of r of t is going to be the skew symmetric of the omega t multiplied by the current rotation of that matrix. So this isn't a mystery because we've saw earlier how we can get what this omega is. Let's say that this omega t is going to be some omega x, omega y, omega z. And this is going to just equal zero. Omega z, negative omega y, negative omega z, zero omega x, omega y, negative omega x, 0, times the r of t. So now let's look at an example where we've got some point p. And this point can be in a Frick's frame. I'm going to draw my x0, zero, y0. Zero. And let's say that you know, this point is attached to a rotating frame, r, which I'm going to write as x1, y1. And so if the coordinates of p with respect to the fixed frame is p0 is equal to the rotation matrix of 1 in frame 0 of p1, then the derivatives, we can apply the derivatives of both sides of this equation. The time derivative of p0 is equal to how fast is this rotation matrix changing times my p in frame 1. Well, we know that the derivative of a rotation matrix is just going to be a skew symmetric matrix. So skew over the instantaneous axis of rotation times r10, that's the first term, times r p in frame 1. Well, from our properties that we had before, skew symmetry is just the cross product. So this is omega cross r1 in frame 0 times p1. And then we can simplify this term because this is just what is p in frame 0. So it's equal to omega cross p in frame 0. So this is telling us the time derivative of how p is changing in frame 0 is just going to be what is the axis we're rotating around cross product with its position in frame 0. The thing that we don't have is what is this omega? Well, this omega value here is the angular velocity of the rotating frame with respect to the fixed frame at time t. And so let us end with an example. Let's say that our r of t is actually 
a rotation about our x-axis by some time-changing function theta of t. So it's totally a rotation on the x-axis with some theta of t. So we're going to compute this using our chain rule. We know that r of t is equal to what is the change dr dt? Well, that is equal to what is dr with respect to d theta times d theta with respect to time. And so this first term, we do know that, is going to be equal to s around the x-axis. is just going to be our skew symmetric around basis vector i times our current rotation matrix. This term that we have here, d theta dt, is just how fast that theta is changing. So it's just theta dot. So we get here is going to be our s omega of t times our rotation matrix t, where this omega of t, we're pulling our theta in across this. So our omega is just going to be our elementary basis vector on the x-axis times theta dot. And we're finished.